So a journal normally has an owner. The owner employs some staff who run the administrative work of the journal <clears throat> and a chief editor. And the owner also appoints a publisher. The chief editor appoints an editorial board and editors. They follow the instructions of organizations like International Committee of Medical Journal Editors or Committee of Publication Ethics. With this, they create a strategy for the journal. When you submit your paper, it goes through an assessment according to the strategy. And 90% of the time it will be rejected because the rejection rate in most journals of even medium quality is around 80, 90%. And 10% uh, that are accepted then become publications. These publications are put together on a website with PDF files. And this is called a journal. So you see these green dotted lines, the, all the stuff concerning research and publication is happening over here. The publisher has nothing to do with it. They simply put together the PDF files into a journal. The owner of the journal should have nothing to do with it. The process of assessment of papers should be an independent process run according to some set principles and strategy. You, as an author, are submitting the paper. You don't want it to be rejected and thrown out. You want it to move over here in this section. That is your objective. <clears throat> this is uh, the Committee of Medical Journal Editors, Committee on Publication Ethics. There are different types of journals, open access. Open access itself is of different types. Beware that there are also predatory journals whose job is to make money by offering publication. Uh, this journal, when I was the chief editor, contained more than 40 editors. So we received 1,600 papers a year, 40 plus people assessed it, and we rejected 88% of them. So this is what the author is up against. The author is up against these people. These are the editors of a journal. I show you a diagram of human beings because these assessments are made by individuals who don't just assess science, but they also have their own feelings, opinions, experiences. So you, you as author might think that your audience is the reader, the clinician who will read your paper. But actually your audience is not them. Your audience is the editors, because if they reject your paper, it will never reach the clinician. So you should get to know the editors because guess what? They have the power to throw you out of the match. Just like a cricket um umpire does or a football referee does. So these editors are in fact umpires and referees. In fact, peer reviewers and referee is a common word used for people who assess papers. So I'd like to just stop here just for a moment and see if people have any comments or questions. And I would like to also see how the system of interaction with colleagues will work. Um, if you guys have any questions at any time, you guys can use the raise your hand feature and then we'll unmute you and you can go ahead and ask any question. And if not, um, if you're not comfortable being unmuted, you can definitely put your question inside the chat box as well. So I, I have the chat box open in front of me. There are only two comments which are by the organizers. 
Uh, I'm quite happy to receive any comments made in the chat. I presume people can also unmute their microphone and ask their question. Is that possible? Um, yeah, they can raise their hands and then we can unmute them. Okay, please uh, do. Okay, so here is a question on the chat. It's a question, Baba. There is another one coming. That's good. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, question by Saad. What do you mean by predatory journals? How can we know them and avoid them? So, well, the answer is simple. There is, uh, well, first of all, the predatory journal is one which will promise, will, which will take your money in order to publish a paper. It will not necessarily put it through a proper peer review process. Uh, and even though you might get it published, it will be of no value to you, your career, or to your patients in the end. Because this type of a journal is not a recognized journal. And there is a list called the Beals list. And this list is, I would recommend, one that you can use. I'm sure there will be others on the internet, but this is the one that I would recommend you use if you want to know whether you are being conned by a predatory journal. Uh, maybe you know that Pakistan itself has nearly 100 medical journals. About 74% of them, about 70 or 74 of them are recognized by the Medical Council. The others are not recognized or in the process of being recognized or have been rejected and will reapply. So look at journal credentials before you make a submission to them. If you write to the editor, uh, there is a question from, uh, from Mir Rafe. Uh, is it a good idea to write an unsolicited sub? email or submission to the editor before formal submission. <clears throat> I'm paraphrasing it. I don't think it is a good idea. The editor of a journal normally is a busy individual who does the work for the journal for free in their free time, not in their normal working time. They are not an employee of the journal usually. <clears throat> They don't have to time to read unsolicited messages. So I would not encourage uh, this type of uh, approach. It might even annoy them. So it might have the opposite effect of what you want to achieve. Use the formal process of the journal that they have advertised. Another question is, are all recognized journals peer reviewed? The answer is no, you will need to check what process each journal uses. Uh, I think in Pakistan for medical council recognition or higher education commission recognition, it is necessary that the journal should have peer review. But guess what? What is peer review? Well, the peer reviewer shouldn't be a friend of the author, shouldn't be a friend of the editor, should be an independent expert. Identifying these people and convincing them to provide peer review is not easy. And peer reviewers are also busy people who offer their assessment or refereeing usually for free. So they are also doing this stuff in their free time. It's not easy for a journal to create a pool of high quality peer reviewers. So that's why I urge you to pay attention to the merits and demerits of the journal where you intend to submit. Question is, what is the best way to start with a systematic review? Sometimes it's quite difficult to find a mentor. Well, Pavan, if you are at Aga Khan University, the SRF should go to the Dean and make a request on behalf of the students to say, please, amongst your employees who teach us, 
can you get some of them to acquire expertise in systematic reviews so they can be our mentors? This would be, in your situation, the best way. Um, I am sure in your faculty, there are some people who are already published systematic reviewers. You can approach them if they have an ongoing project and join their team. Um, that's all I can say. I think you can ask me. I can give you some comments on your questions in this presentation or outside this presentation through my uh, <clears throat> Through a, through a platform that I have concerning publications and systematic reviews called Health Education Research via social media on LinkedIn. That would work. Um, you can also buy my book on systematic reviews. That could help too. Um, then next question is by Zafar, Shanyal Zafar. Is it true that qualitative studies carry a generally higher rate of approval? Well, I think the opposite is true. Qualitative studies have a higher rate of approval among social scientists, not necessarily amongst medical scientists. If you think about it, in very general terms, there are two types of research. One is answers the question, what happened to people or what did people do? These are observational studies. Qualitative study is a type of observational study. And another type of research is, answers the question, what should we do in the future? This type of study is called an experimental study or applied research study. So the first type of study does nothing to change anything. Because simply by making observations, you don't change anything, right? To change something, you need to do a study that creates an intervention that will be used in the future. So applied research is what changes things. Observational research usually does not change much. Well, there are some circumstances when observational studies will and can bring about change. Uh, but usually it is the experimental studies or applied research studies that are at the forefront of people who invest in research. Um, and with this information, it's possible to determine what doctors and patients should do in the future. So what doctors, patients, nurses, midwives, radiographers, healthcare assistants should do in the future. I hope that makes sense. Okay, shall we move on? Yes, I think we can move on and then people who have questions can continue putting it in the chat or use their or unmute their mic after. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Let's go back to the slides. So we have already spent about 40 minutes. Is, is, uh, is the pace too slow? Well, maybe it is. I'll speed up a little and if it is too fast, then let me know. We have till seven o'clock. So we have an hour and 20 more minutes. So then you can pace yourself based on that. Accordingly. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, so these are some of the things that go wrong in research. People can present 
their own positive findings and not report the negative findings. They can claim they are making unexpected findings. They can cheat <clears throat> during the course of the study or after. <clears throat> Editors want to pick this type of problem up. If this type of problem is picked up, there can be sanctions. But the first important thing is to recognize that uh, <clears throat> these are four examples. Plagiarism, duplicate publication, salami. These are the different definitions. I won't go in detail uh, except with plagiarism. When you submit a paper, the journal normally would put it through authenticate or turn it in or some other such software. And in this paper, one can see that 34% of the paper, the text of 34% of the paper exists somewhere else or has a source somewhere else or an original source is somewhere else. So it can appear that there has been copying, word by word copying of text. So this is called plagiarism. One of the email questions was, how can one avoid getting into problems with it? <clears throat> I think the, the, these are my three, three pieces of advice. Reference the original source. Use your own words to describe what somebody else has written. And if you are going to copy the original text, use inverted commas to show that you have taken the text from someone else. If you have done these two or three things, then I think you will stay free of problems related to plagiarism. <clears throat> okay, frequently authors think that peer reviewers reject papers. But actually that is not true. A lot of the papers are just rejected by authors by editors even without sending it to referees. So this emphasizes even more that uh, your audience is, your real audience is the editor. You need to get through the editor in order to get published, in order to be read by others. So give you an example of a study I was involved in. The idea was conceived in 1996. Recruitment of patients started in 1998. Data patient recruitment finished in 2006. The write up of the manuscript started in 2006 and published in 2009. So you can see the life of an important large piece of study is long. That's one reason why I advise you to consider doing systematic reviews because they can be, depending on the number of studies to be included, completed within a few months. Your idea is to have your paper converted from a Word file into a published PDF file as soon as possible. You want to receive this kind of an email. I am pleased to accept your manuscript. Your paper will be published within seven to 10 days, etc. <clears throat> but your readers have a different objective. Their objective is to combine their knowledge and experience about patient care with the knowledge you publish in your scientific articles so that they can engage in evidence-based practice. So the papers are the E of the evidence-based medicine. It's a noble endeavor to write papers because without it, evidence-based medicine is not possible. Here are the four steps of evidence-based medicine. And you can see that identification of papers, appraisal of the papers, and using to put them in practice are the key steps. The paper has this structure. It's called IMRED. 
starts with the title page and abstract, then the IMRED, which is introduction, methods, results, and discussion. And then acknowledgements, references, and tables, and so on. And the initial assessment is based only on these three things, usually. So nobody reads your cover letter. Nobody reads your results section. Nobody reads your discussion section. Your title, abstract, and introduction have the strongest influence on the initial assessment by the editors.